Welcome to Mid-American Gardener. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois. So my areas would be cut flowers, landscaping with perennials, along those lines. However, we have three really talented and knowledgeable horticulturalists and plant pathologists here. And so let's find out a little bit about who's here and what their expertise is and you can make your questions fit their expertise area. I wanna start first with Dr. Don White. Hi, Don. Hi, how are you? Doing good. I'm Don White. I'm an emeritus professor of plant pathology from University of Illinois. And for 33 years, I taught introductory plant pathology diseases of field crops, and diseases of ornamentals and turf grasses. I did research on corn genetic resistance. More recently, I've become a master gardener, which has been an awful lot of fun. And I have a question on ivy. Okay. And the viewer writes in that we have ivy along the north side of, of a home we purchased. It crawls under the siding, yeah, and it squeezes the other plants, yeah, and the shrubs. Well, they want to know what to do about it. And I guess the previous owner kind of solved the problem because they just went ahead and sold the house. <laughs> <laughs> okay, if I were you, what I would do, number one, in the spring of the year when the ivy starts to grow, spray Roundup. Roundup has a big advantage in that the compound, when it gets into the soil, the soil bacteria will break it down. So it's not gonna be taken up by adjacent plants. Now, the problem you're gonna to have to worry about with Roundup, you're gonna spray it on the foliage of anything you wanna kill. So if you have flowering plants that you wanna protect, you're gonna to have to surround them in cardboard or plywood or anything you can think of so that the spray does not get on those and spray the ivy. Some of us have used paint brushes and painted it onto leaves. And what you gotta watch is you don't want to have it beating up on the ivy. In other words, on the surface of the, the ivy leaf because it, it might not be taken up and you can get a surfactant for that if you can find one or don't tell anybody but I think some of us use dishwashing detergent and then what you're going to do you're probably going to spray it two or three times kill off whatever you can then you get in there and pull it out anything that's left try to pull then I got to lay down a layer of uh, newspaper mulch on top of the newspaper and in the next year go hunting and see if you can find some more of it Boy, that, that should cover it all. That'd be a fun sport. <laughs> you, you get some exercise. Oh, yeah. You can tell everyone out there is probably just singing, oh, let's do oh, it. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Give it an exciting name. <laughs> well, thank you, Don, very much. Right. And now let's go to you, Kay Carnes. Hi, um, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener, and my areas of expertise are herbs, um, vegetables, uh, mostly heirloom vegetables, and um, plants and all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> and I have a, a question from a viewer and she said that three years ago, her sister started an herb garden and she planted several herbs, including mint in a small two by three area between the sidewalk and her house. And the only thing that survived, of course, was the mint. Um, and she's been trying to get rid of it ever since. Um, she's uh, been pulling it out and spraying Roundup and it won't die. So probably the best thing you can do, and it's good that it's a small contained area, is just get in there and start digging. Um, dig deep and get all the roots out. And it, you can, if you start at the edge and work towards the center, it will probably work a little better. And you're probably gonna be pretty, have to be pretty persistent and maybe do this several times because mint will sprout from the smallest little piece of root that it can, has. Um, so just be persistent and dig deep and eventually you'll probably get it out. Kay, did you notice that first picture showed mint in containers? Yeah. <laughs> yes, and I put mine in drain tiles. Mm -hmm. I have too. I set on end, um, but yes, the best thing to do with mint is to keep it in And make sure the container doesn't break. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it can still and get that away. And it has, has a bottom. Mint from flowering and spreading seeds? Uh, do you have an idea for us? Well, I mean, you got to keep the mint, pin, the flower well, sure. pinched off. And so. it's great in iced teas mm -hmm. and all kinds oh, yeah. of that. Use the mint. And mint's, yeah. you know, it's got a lot of health benefits, too. It does. It's, it's really good. So, so, yeah. so there's some good ideas about mint. <laughs> Let's go on to you, Jim Schuster, next to me. Okay, I'm Jim Schuster. I'm a retired horticulturist and plant pathologist at the U of I. I have a question on oak wilt. And you see it's on their black and white oaks. 
Now that's two different groups of oaks. The black oaks are in the red oak group, pointed leaves, and the white oaks are obviously in the white oak group with rounded leaves. And the reason I mention that is that it does make a difference on how they react to this disease. The red oak group trees are going to die quickly, within generally uh, one to two years, where the white oaks are more resistant and may last many, many years. And because of that, the uh, chemical which he was asking about using is propiconazole. It will work better on the white oaks even if they have some oak wilt in them. Uh, preferably less than 10% of the tree is infected with the yolk wilt when you're using propiconazole. If it's in the red oak group tree, you have to use that before the tree has any infection if you're going to try and keep a red oak uh, tree alive uh, because it the oak wilt spreads so fast in it. In addition to the propiconazole being used preventively, uh, you also need, once the tree gets infected, you need sanitation. And that means cutting out the branches, especially in the white oaks, that are infected and uh, cutting the roots. And it needs to be cut three feet deep and is really probably should have a commercial person who knows what he's doing do this because if you start cutting too close to some healthy trees, you'll end up killing the tree because you cut off all the roots. Uh, and by the way, if this is a big cluster of trees, do plan to lose some of the trees that were not infected make, uh, at the time you're treating in that because with uh, how you have to cut roots may leave some root grafts with the disease in it attached to the healthy tree and they'll, they'll spread through those roots. Okay, very good. That was quite detailed. Thank you. Well, I want to take a moment now to remember Randy Thornton. We have lost a member of our Mid-American Gardener panel and Randy was such a good panelist, um, great on the show gave us a lot of good information and he had a great sense of humor. So we, we miss Randy. We are uh, so happy that he was on the show with us for 20 years. So thank you, Randy Thornton. Let's go next to a special Did You Know About Trees. This is, uh, we're not always big on the plant stuff necessarily. This is a uh, little door knocker that I found in a junk shop down in Arkansas and it's a trowel so I thought that was kind of something a little bit cool so and I think in. you could tell a gardener lived there if you yep. if you had a trowel door I would think so I'd like to have one of those <laughs> I, I do have one that was a great clip that was showing Randy Thornton and he was on his last show was July 31st of 2014 Okay, now let's go to our clip about Did You Know? Let's learn about trees. Trees can make their own food from water, sunlight, carbon dioxide, and nutrients from the soil. The phone line's next, so let's go to the phone lines. We don't have very many, so if you have a question, call in. Let's go first to Mike. He's got a question about catalpa worms. This is on line two. Mike, what have you got for us? Well, I'm trying to find out uh, when to look for catalpa worms on catalpa trees. Uh, I'm not trying to get rid of them, but I'm trying to find them yep. to use them for fishing. I <laughs> see. Good man. <laughs> <laughs> so Don, do you know the answer? Well, I know where there's a couple of catalpa trees and I've kind of looked for them. And the worms usually come in about August. Okay. And uh, then you hope that they fall onto the ground where you can pick them up. They're great bluegill bait and great bass bait. <laughs> I was hoping you were going to tell me you had a tree that was loaded with them. You were <laughs> going to tell me where it was. <laughs> This isn't mid-American fisher, <laughs> fisher well, persons, but it does. We could try. It does help. Um, also, tomato hornworms. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. those are mm -hmm. nice and ugly and big. They'd be great. And so you need to be scouting for these different worms, but I guess it that works very good because my son told me that. So. And I've used corn ear worms too. Okay. <laughs> All right. So a little segue into fishing, but it does help <laughs> to get some of these. Um, worms off of our plants. So <laughs> that was kind of a fun one. Thank you, Mike, for that question. Well, while we wait for more questions on the phone lines, let's go back to emails. And Don, we're going to throw it over to you. Good. I have one on hydrangea and the 
Listener had a few hydrangea that failed to produce, but a few blooms. Foliage was healthy. And they want to know if they should protect it. Okay, now you've got, with hydrangeas, you've got like five or so species. So, and then within those species, you've got varieties. So you've got a number of different plants. A lot of them that I'm familiar with are producing flower buds one year and then use those buds the next year to produce flowers. In other words, they're, they're growing and producing flowers on old wood. Others will produce it on new wood. Now, I think what happened in some cases this year, 2013, a plant would have produced flower buds, and then it had to go through the winter, 13, 14, mm -hmm. which was just absolutely horrific. A lot of those buds were probably killed by the cold weather. Then in the spring, we had a warm up, and guess what happened? Well, then we had a hard freeze. Mm -hmm. So what happened then, you killed off more buds. So there's some of the varieties of hydrangea, some of the ones that formed buds and carried them through the winter, that just didn't flower a lot. Another thing that'll happen is you prune them at the wrong time. If you prune the old wood out of the, the ones that produce on old wood, then you're gonna remove the flowers. Those species that'll actually produce flowers on new wood, if you get out there and start pruning in the earlier summer, you're going to eliminate those flowers. If you have a new wood producer, uh, you're going to see flowers, what, about July? Mm -hmm. And the older wood ones, the ones I'm more familiar with, you're going to see them in the spring. So I think a lot of it was winter damage because I suspect it, it was one of the old wood ones. And it was a double whammy, winter oh, damage a and a hard frost late in spring. Yeah, that, that late frost in the in the spring did a lot of damage on fruit trees. But when you think about it, we had an actual winter last <laughs> year. Yeah. I mean, it was an actual winter. Snow oh, cover yeah. and cold. Uh -huh. So I had students that di they didn't understand how this could happen. I said, well, you just haven't been around long <laughs> enough. I remember winters like that. Yeah. 79, yeah, 80. I was yeah. say they were probably born in the 70s uh -huh. when we had the last, mm -hmm. you know, These series. students didn't see the 70s. So they were <laughs> from a different decade that was younger than that. Okay, so thank you for that. And let's go on to UK. Okay, um, I have a, a, a email from a viewer and said, would you be so kind as to identify this flower for me? <clears throat> it has foliage just like an iris, but the blooms look like a cross between a miniature tiger lily and a daffodil. Well, she's correct on both issues. This is a blackberry lily, um, and it is kind of unique because it is a member of the iris family, so it does have the iris leaf. Uh, the flower does look like a lily flower, and the fruit looks like a blackberry, and that's why they call them blackberry lilies. Um, they were originally imported from China, and they have since naturalized throughout the United States. And um, it's actually uh, listed as an Illinois wildflower now. Really? Yes. I did not know that. Yes. And so um, they're really nice little plants. They're not very invasive. Mm. And, and um, I have several growing in different spots in my yard. So. Oh, I just love them. I'll put them with uh, the... Um, Oh, now the Asclepias tuberosa, butterfly mm -hmm. weed. Oh, I put mm -hmm. it, the orange butterfly oh, yeah, weed that'd be great. with the kind of orangey uh -huh. flecked blackberry they bloom, lily. They bloom in a mid to late summer. And, uh, it's beautiful. Yeah, I love them. We love these kinds of emails. If you have a what is it for us to identify, mm -hmm. that's really fun. And then uh, for my perennial classes, I always said what were good combinations with it. So even if you have a good combination, that would be great as well. Well, thank you for that. We're getting some phone calls. So, Jim, you're going to be next, but we'll, we'll go to phone calls and then we'll be back to you. Uh -huh. Let's go to line two. And Susie has a question for us on line two. Hi, Susie. Hi, Diane. I have a question about diatomaceous earth. Okay. I used it last year around my hosta bed um, to control slugs. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering how often do you have to apply that? Okay, so slugs for hosta. I have used it, and have others of you used it as well? No, I have no. not. I have used it because when the slug goes over it, 
Yeah. It's not a good thing for the slug. <laughs> right, tear them up. <laughs> so you want to just look to make sure it's still uh, cutting edge, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> you want to make sure it's not tramped down. Do you want to add anything no, to I that? No, I, I control slugs other ways. Oh. I do want to talk about uh, other ways to control, but make sure that diatomaceous earth has not been pressed down into the soil. You want it loose and fluffy and sharp up above the soil. Now, let's do other ways of controlling slugs, and then we'll go back to the phone lines. Well, my, I had slugs all over my hospice, and they were right where they got a lot of rain and watering, so I dug them all up and moved them over one foot so they're underneath the eaves of my house so they couldn't get the rain. Now the ground is dry, just enough to keep the slugs down, but not dry enough to dry out the uh, hospice. Mm -hmm. And I never had to treat the for slugs after that. So environmental. Environmental. Mm -hmm. See if you can get, find or uh, plant the plants where it's a little bit drier. And don't mulch your hosta right. because they like to crawl underneath the where it stays mm -hmm. moist. So and that includes using plastic uh, on the mulch. Yeah. Oh mulch. yes. Mm -hmm. right. A lot of people put mul plastic. I don't think of that as a mulch. No, oh, it's definitely a mulch. Yeah. The other thing is not to have a ribbon or a road of hosta leading from, you know, a slug highway, I call <laughs> it. So try to break it up and put it in drier, but still able to grow spots. Wow, we love slug questions because they're just a possibility. Now, we have a follow-up on line three about the catalpa worms from Chuck. Hi, Chuck. What's your, what's your solution for catalpa worms? Hi, Diane. This is your old friend, Chuck. It is. It's our very <laughs> own Mid-American Gardener, Chuck. Hi. Hi. I just couldn't resist. Uh, Good. Because I hang out with Phil Nixon a lot, and, and I had a question, that same question about uh, catalpa caterpillars. Mm -hmm. Apparently, a parasite that they released to help control gypsy moths has, has a taste for lots of large caterpillars, so things like cecropia moths and, and luna moths and especially catalpa caterpillars, such that, that they're really hard to find now. So it controlled those. It That's controlled those better than gypsy moth, apparently. <laughs> that is a shame. What about tomato hornworms? Uh, they, have the, they have their little wasps that get in them, yeah. but, but I, I, don't know that, I don't know that they have been especially effective on those, because I still see those. I like still see those. Seasonally, mm -hmm. you know, one season they'll be really bad, and then the next season not so bad. But so that's why everyone's looking for catalpa worms, is because of the gypsy yeah. moth control. Well, if you look at the catalpas hmm. on campus, you never see any leaf, leaf feeding late in the season, which... You know, Was an had, ID feature we, we, before. Yeah, we had a, a catalpa grove where they planted a bunch of them for posts or whatnot. And, you know, like just about every August, early September, they'd be just stripped bare. And there'd be catalpa caterpillars all over the place. But apparently that's that's become very difficult to find. Well, that's why. So everyone's looking for them, but they've been controlled not as the first means of control. Right, so you may have to go to Don's uh, corn earworms to get them. <laughs> <laughs> those, those are hard to get out, too. <laughs> but tomato hornworms, unfortunately, you do find, so that's a right. possibility. I know that Japanese beetles do not work. <laughs> that's correct, that's correct. Well, thank you, Chuck, for letting us know about that, and we'll thank Phil also. Okay. <laughs> thank you, bye-bye. Okay. Oh, that was fun, this is great. <laughs> well, let's go on to another uh, caller. Phil has a question about um, uh, rose lilacs, or just lilacs, and on line four. Hi, Phil, what's your question? Hi, yes, the question about lilac bush and rose bush. Uh, oh, okay. When is the best time to trim those back, and how far back do you trim them? Okay. So pruning on both lilacs and roses. Who, does someone want to jump in on one of them? I'll Otherwise, let, I'll let Don take it. I'll oh. do, I'll do <laughs> some pruning. Well, okay. I, know my, I prune my roses in the spring. Yes, I second it. And I prune it down to where you finally found the green stem, because you tend to have the stems die back, and the dead stems turn brown. So I cut right at the brown green line in the spring. And if somebody else wants to answer the lilac. Well, to follow up on oh. the rose one, don't get antsy. Don't right. one warm day in February, don't do it. Don't do it. Wait don't. because you'll right. then have dieback. I'll start on the lilac if anyone wants to jump in. Lilacs need to be pruned back after flowering and when they get too old they don't flower well. So you want to do the one third rule where you take the oldest branches out after flowering, and you might end up taking just two 
trunks out, you know, two branches down to the ground or as low as you can the first year if it's big and woody, and then one third the next year, and then the next year one third, and that would have rejuvenated the entire shrub. So don't go over one third. So you do want to trim the whole branch down and do it after flowering. Now if you don't prune that part, go ahead and deadhead the flowers. They'll do so much better. So that's your lilac question, and it's, that would probably be in June that you prune, and the roses would be maybe April, May. Right. So you can rest up. We're all ready to do something, but don't <laughs> do it too soon. All right, well, let's go to a vegetable question, and Tony has a question for us on line five. Hi, Tony. Line five, yes. What's your question? Oh, did we lose you? Tony? Can you, can you hear my voice? Yes. Speak to me and don't listen to the TV. Yeah, you have a vegetable garden indoors. Oh, wow. Okay, faster. <laughs> What's your question? Okay, well. Can well my question, no, my question was, can you have a vegetable garden indoors? Oh, can you? Oh, can you? Oh, can, oh, can you? you? I thought you said you do yeah. have one. Okay, can you have a vegetable garden indoors? Well, it'd be pretty tough. Um, they need quite a bit of light. Uh, you know, they need six to eight hours of sunlight, most vegetables, the bulk of them. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of varieties that do well in containers. Um, if you can get them enough light, they probably would do okay. Um, lettuce would probably lettuce. Yeah, lettuce would be great. You know, the green any of the greens Spinach. would, would yeah. work. Um, probably even something like radishes. Um, sure, would work um, <clears throat> because they they don't need quite as much light, and you know you can plant them earlier. Um, if you have any deck or anything outside when the weather warms up. Um, like I said, there's a number of varieties of like tomatoes and, and peppers and all kinds of vegetables mm -hmm. that, that you could put in big containers. But I'm thinking the root crops wouldn't do so well inside. No. They need cool, a lot of the root crops, turnips, beets, carrots, mm -hmm. need to start when it's cool and then get warmer and your house right. would be the same temperature. Yeah. yeah. But if you were going to grow the beets and the radishes for the green part, you can do it that way. That's right. Sure. You could go yeah, for you the could greens. do that. And, mm -hmm. and turnips, too. Oh, turnip what a greens waste. Are, yeah. I mean, That's you true. can use the top and you can mm -hmm. harvest mm -hmm. them. Yeah. But yes, you're right. You could do it for the greens. Mm -hmm. So that is a possibility. Not an overly. Not a very good one. <laughs> I was going to no. say, not an overly <laughs> exciting one because you would get not as great a, mm -hmm. a crop. No. Okay. Well, let's see if. Do you have a quick email for us? We'll go to that and then come back to yes, phones. Yes. Uh, this person was had uh, evergreen bushes that have turned uh, brown on the one side. Okay. And uh, they don't know how to diagnose the problem and what can they do and where can they get it diagnosed. So the easiest thing is look up in uh, uh, your phone book for your local extension office and take it there. And if that local extension office doesn't have any way that can identify it, the problem, then ask them if they can send it on to their state extension plant clinic and have it, the problem identified there. And we might have a screen that shows the plant clinic uh, here at the University of Illinois. It's in Turner Hall. Right. I don't know if we have that. We don't have it, but we'll try to get that so we can put it up whenever we get those kind of questions. Right. But yeah, that's that was a good one uh, to, to know about. I have a little bit of a reminder here, and then we'll go from there. Uh, there is a reminder that there's still space on the nine-day trip that I'm taking with Mid-American Gardener this July to Germany, and we're going to visit both private and public gardens, big ones and small ones across the country. So if you want more information, just call WILL's Donda Beard at 217-333-7300 or you can visit will.illinois.edu slash will travel. Okay, well let's go to a mag quiz next and see what we've got for us there. Mag quiz. What would cause a hydrangea to turn pink? A, the soil pH increases. B, the soil pH decreases. C, it is too cold. A, the soil pH increases. 
Acidic soils will cause hydrangeas to bloom blue, and alkaline soils will cause the plant to produce pink flowers. Hydrangeas have been popular today. <laughs> so Now, we want to encourage any of you, if you have any questions for us, we would be happy to answer those on the air. So you can email them, look at the end of the show, and you'll see where to email those. Well, it's so important to have great panelists. I want to thank you three for being <laughs> here. We do have about 30, I think, that are on the show at various times. So if you see them, tell them thank you, because it helps make the show great. We thank you for watching. We hope that you will have a great week planning or gardening. See you next time. Goodbye. <laughs>